So, as usual, please go to rc3club slash sign in. Uh, give us all your deeds so that we guys can get you guys better sponsors, better prizes, and all that cool jazz and get you guys jobs. So, we're going to start off with some news from Jill. So, Jill, take it away. Just a little uh, forward. I'm so sorry for anybody who's registered in class right now. This is literally a shit show. Like, this is bad. I got it for um, uh, this, this thing that this guy, you know, as you do, uh, he, he wrote this thing for the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is like a $5 Raspberry Pi. It's super small. It's, it's really cool. Um, and what it does is you plug it into any computer and it will uh, pull network traffic, it will pull credentials from your browser, all that stuff, even if it's locked. Um, he does a demo. It's all open source. Um, he explains like how it works, um, which is really cool. Uh, this is the same guy who wrote um, the MySpace forum. Um, so this guy is really smart. He's done a couple of DEF CON talks too. Um, uh, so yeah, definitely check that out. Uh, take a look at the code. I haven't had a chance to read over yet, but um, I'm sure it's really interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, VMware. So there was a there was a, a, a vulnerability in VMware that came out um, during this big hackathon. Um, that basically a guest VM, so the machine inside your machine, could get access to the host's memory um, through the uh, drag and drop and copy and paste like a cross OS thing. Um, so they patched that really quickly. Um, it was $150,000 uh, reward for that. And the, the team that actually uh, found it like earned over half a million dollars during the same like hackathon thing from like they have like Google, they have VMware, they have like, all sorts of stuff. Um, so, yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. Uh, so patch your VMware. Um, there's another Linux security hole. Um, so there's there's this thing called Crypt Setup. Um, it's basically the standard when you encrypt your hard drives um, in Linux. It's like built in and stuff. It uses this thing called Lux, L-U-K-X. And uh, basically, if you just hold down the enter key for like 70 seconds, you get a root shell. It's really complex hack, okay? <laughs> uh, we figured it out. Oh, he fell asleep on the keyboard. Yeah, he had a key and just had a root shell. The best uh, uh, yeah, so, so this was really interesting. Um, it's been in, like, crypt setup for, like, a long time. Um, so I don't know if there's a patch yet. I think there is a fix somewhere, um, like, a way to make it so it doesn't happen. But oddly enough, it only happens um, is it, it only happens if you've encrypted your system partitions. So by having good security, you have bad security. Joel, you're supposed to like change like the line that says continue to don't keep turning off. Don't encrypt the password. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is. I saw someone. Yeah, there is. So there's a there's just the patch code. It's pretty simple. If you're actually using crypt setup or something, um, you can patch it yourself if you like. And then there's a, there's a new DDoS attack called Black Nurse, and what it does is it uses um, ICMP type 3 packets, um, which is, I think, uh, destination unreachable. Um, and so basically what, it, what that means is that uh, it, it errors out on the server and it, hang, it makes it hang. It causes the CPU load to go really high versus overloading with a, with a number of packets. So you can send like, it's kind of like slow, slow orders, it's not like a lot of packets, but it, what it causes the, the web server itself to do is, is just hang. Um, and, it, and the CPU load, go, load goes really high, and then it stops responding and stuff. Uh, there is a way to fix it. Um, and I guess it's a good thing that, like, I think they said that when the attack is happening, the person who's sending it also can't um, make web requests like at all, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how widely this is being used, or then there's not a whole lot of details about it. I think there is a proof of concept of that, though. Uh, I don't know, what's this news? Yeah. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, so uh, if you type like a, a pin code in, in your phone, um, there's a way that you can use this thing that's been developed. It's called WinTalker, and uh, it can predict like it can accurately detect what you've typed based on how your finger affects the radio waves that are coming out from your phone. So like if you're connected to a Wi-Fi, you can see how the Wi-Fi like 
bands are connecting back like between the router and the phone, and you can see how they're changed based on your finger placement, and they can predict like which numbers you actually pressed on your phone for like a passcode. So that is uh, frightening. Um, so don't use passcodes, I guess. Fingerprints. <laughs> There's <laughs> it's like kind of accurate. It's like 68 percent, but um, stuff always gets improved. So um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Can't have my Apple things. All right, thank you, Joel. Finish up. So Bo was here last week talking about hacking for defense. So if you're interested in doing that, contact Bo. He's our department chair for CSEC. Uh, this weekend is the UP competition. So uh, if you're going to that, good luck and have fun. I hear Red Team has a lot of fun things in store for you. So uh, the Grim Co-op opportunity is still happening. So uh, Jamie uh, will be here this week and tomorrow for the CPF, and he'll be doing uh, interviews for the week after we get back from Thanksgiving. So if you want to go work for Grim, talk to Jamie. So RC3 CTF, it's this weekend. Woo! Woo! So some people have actually asked me this. It's actually reachable anywhere online. It's in AWS. So all you have to go is to HTTPS uh, colon slash slash CTF.RC3.club. You can reach it anywhere in the world. So you don't have to be here on campus to do it. You can be anywhere in the world to do it. It starts tonight at 9 p.m. And it'll go until 11.59, 59 p.m. on Sunday. So, and then we'll release the winners and all that sometime during Monday. So, uh, so yeah, team up together with your friends and let's do it. Uh, ShmooCon tickets. So I was told today that Shmoo is a student. Uh, all your letters have to be in today. Um, and just so you know, December first, second round of tickets, and December tenth is third round of tickets. Shmoo is a student actually right now. Oh, interesting. All right, they've never done that before. Okay. All right. Uh, so our getting down here to the last final part of our semester. So next week is Thanksgiving. None of us will be here. Hopefully you're not. So uh, neither will RC3. Uh, and then the week after, we're going to do Android slash uh, alumni presentation, which is to be announced. And then the week after, we're going to do like a King of the Hill type of thing with some of the boxes that you guys have interacted throughout the uh, semester. Um, and then we're just going to do a hangout day. So we're just going to be chilling out in the lab. Some of us are going to be studying for finals. Some of us are going to be doing King of the Hill. So we're just going to be really just hanging out um, the week before finals. So if you just want to come join us, definitely do that. So, All right. And now I hand it off to Brad, who is going to show you all the bits. Reverse it. You can just take your head now. CTS, it's okay to do it. Uh, don't don't break a program and like send exploits all over the internet. We're not gonna back you up. We're not gonna bail you out of jail. I'll probably come there and like laugh at you a little bit. Just a little I'll bit. visit. Ben will. He'll laugh at you too with me. <laughs> all right. We're decoding bits. You're in my world. I like this stuff. So there are two types of binary analysis. There is dynamic and there is static. Now, dynamic involves running the program you are analyzing. You're going to be seeing what it's doing. You're going to be collecting output based on the actions it's performing on your system. So it's going to be actually running in your environment. Now, this is obviously detrimental if you are running some, some type of malware or code that tries to RMR up your box, something, something. You never really know what it's going to be. That's why you're analyzing the binary. So if you're performing dynamic analysis, 
make sure you are doing it in a safe environment that you know you can fix and will not screw you over big time. Another one, the other analysis method is static. Now this is analyzing the binary without actually running it. So you are going to be looking at the binary code of the program and seeing what it does, how it operates, trying to derive some meaning from the structures that you can get out of the code. So static tends to be a little difficult. Uh, it's, you're going to be using assembly. You can't avoid that, I'm sorry. But it's, it gets good results. You learn how the program works on a very deep level. So first off, we come into what's assembly, what's machine code, what's a coding language, how do they all relate and stuff. So machine code, it's what the processor runs. You know how people say computers are all just ones and zeros? That's what machine code is. The processor is interpreting those ones and zeros and executing electronic statements and giving you back more ones and zeros. So assembly is taking those ones and zeros and translating them into something that's like more human readable. So for example, up there, uh, hex 89D8, that's machine code. Would you rather look at that all day or would you rather look at move EAX EBX, which if you don't know what that means, you will shortly. So the yellow statement is assembly code. And as you can see, it's a lot easier to read than the hex code unless you're a computer, in which case I don't know what you're doing here. You already know all this. <laughs> so coding languages, C. C is what I'm going to be relating most of this to because C translates straight into assembly. So for example, X plus equals one, it's C. It looks a lot nicer than add EAX one, which looks a lot nicer than that hex crapshoot right there. So all programming leaders do is they abstract away from machine language in order to make your lives a little bit easier as a coder and make it so you don't want to make your own coding language. So what's assembly? Like I said, it is a translation of machine code to a human readable form. It's, it's a one-to-one -one translation. So it's not like it's going through a compiler or anything. It's, it's a lookup table. It's very simple. Uh, it, it's long, usually for complicated architectures like x86. However, all it is is like a lookup table saying if it has this bit set in this position, perform this set of rules, and so on, so on, so on. So on. It's basically just sits between C and the hardware, isn't it? So as a there, it's just assembly and machine code is how you directly interact with the processor. C doesn't do that. It, it uses machine code to do that. So it's a simple language, uh, but at the same time, because of that, it's very complicated. It's simple in that there isn't a whole lot to learn about it. It's complicated in that that means that it takes more steps to perform an action and you need to know how to recognize those steps and the sort of representation in your head that they form. Um, so for this, you're gonna need to learn assembly. So part one of that is learning how assembly stores data. And this is registers and memory. Registers are like variables for the processor. They are small chunks of data. They are incredibly fast. Uh, but there are a few of them and you can't like make more or less. You can't say X equals one. You are given a set of registers and you like them or you don't use them, that's, that's it. You don't get a choice in the matter. Memory is your RAM. Now it's much slower, however it's good for persistent access because you typically have much more storage than you have register access. Registers you can usually store probably like seven, eight, nine things concurrently at the same time. Uh, memory you can generally store, you generally have more than eight or nine bytes of memory. So registers, as I said, those are variables for the CPU. They're temporary. You don't use those for long time storage. You're not gonna assign something to a, a register throughout your entire program uh, unless there's like some strict requirement on speed or something or you're writing a very optimized program. It's just generally not done. Compilers usually won't do that. So you have general purpose registers. Registers have specific tasks. Uh, the CPU will treat them as special objects. If you mess with some of them, uh, you better know what you're doing, otherwise you are going to break shit and it's going to break in a hard way. So general purpose registers are ones you can generally touch and mess around with without any real repercussions on the system. Uh, RAX, RBX, RCX, RDX, RSI, RDI, these are just like data and counter registers. They, they, they have specific associations with them, but those were created that way people programmed in assembly not C, so they don't really apply anymore to all these compilers, and they just automate this out for us in the easiest possible way. So next up is the stack. Stack registers are special, you generally don't want to modify these. These manage the, the stack, which is a memory structure that we'll cover later, which is where your local variables are stored. 
they are where your function return addresses are stored, which allows for recursion, which is what the primary creation of the stack was. And we will cover that shortly, and you will learn what it is because it's a very important part of this. Next up is the instruction pointer, which is our IP in this case. Now, this stores the address of the next function, or sorry, the next instruction to pull and execute. So, as it's going along, it will keep incrementing this and it'll keep grabbing the next instruction over and over. If you touch the RIP, you're going to change the control flow of the program, which is what if statements and loops will do. Uh, but you'll have structures that handle that for you. You generally do not want to modify RIP directly unless you're doing something really crazy. So, registers, uh, you can access bits of the register. This, this doesn't always come in handy. Uh, it's very, I don't see it very often, but it's nice to know when you see an AL or a DH as a register, what it actually is. So you can, uh, you can access the bits of the register based on a modified calling. So R RAX is the 64 bits register. So if you call EAX, it's going to get you the lower 32 bits of that, so it's gonna chop it in half. If you just take off the E and you call AX, it's going to chop that in half again. Uh, it's hard to explain, uh, so there's a, there's a diagram up there that kind of explains it. It's, it's a bit of a weird concept, but it's, it's used uh, sometimes when you're managing bytes instead of whole integers or double words or anything like that. So I got some examples up there. If you get, con if you get confused, these slides are online. Uh, I tried to put as much content into them so they would be a good reference source for if you forget something, because uh, this is a lot of information I'm going to be throwing at you in the coming time. So if you, if you have any questions at any point in this, ask away. Uh, I just want to make sure you guys are understanding this because it is a bit of an involved topic. Right. So memory access. Uh, this is your RAM. Uh, it's not used for long-term storage, but in terms of the program, it, it really is. RAM, RAM is used to store the program state that needs to be present for most of the program's operation. So if you're storing a socket for a web server, a value for a counter, anything else like that is going to be stored in your RAM because the register is too temporary and a hard drive is too permanent. So if you're gonna operate on a value of memory, you actually have to pull into a register first. When you're doing X plus equals one in C, uh, it's abstracting that away from you. But what it's really doing is it's getting the value stored. It's stored at X, it's pulling it into a register, it's operating on it in the processor, and then it takes the register and it puts it back into memory. So it's a multi-step process that it abstracts out for you. That's why higher level languages are nice like that. They make it a little bit easier, uh, but now you're gonna start delving into how your computer actually works from a very low level perspective. So assembly has mechanisms for loading from memory, otherwise there'd be no way you can do it because this is about as low as you can go generally. So when you're accessing memory, there are things known as memory segments. Uh, everything your computer is doing is stored in memory. Now, the, the entire program, the entire state of it, when, when you run it, it's, it's stored in memory and it's just, it's just a large, large array of bytes, basically. It's nothing really complicated. However, this, this array of bytes is formatted in such a way that there are permissions. Much like file systems have permissions, this chunk of memory has permissions. Some sections might be read-only, some sections might be read-write, some might be executable but not writable. Uh, you can see these when you're executing the program, or when you are inspecting the program, you can take a look at this. Uh, it's hard-coded into the binary when it's created, and you can sort of see what the permissions are and sort of see how the program is structured in memory and what it's doing. And each of these segments has a specific use case uh, from the compiler standpoint. So this is an overview of the segments as they relate to a program. Now, as you can, like low addresses would be something approaching hex uh, zero, and then high addresses would be approaching the maximum address of your RAM or your processor type, etc. If you have a 64-bit processor, it's gonna be two to the 64 minus one. So that's where the high addresses are. Now, we have all these data segments, uh, and the layout is moderately important. It's nice to know so you have an idea of how it works in memory, what you're doing. Uh, the important part is the stack and the heap, how they have zeros. They are dynamic structures, 
and they grow, and they grow towards each other. Uh, that's important to pay attention to because it, it will deal with a lot of variables. That's where most of your variables are stored in memory. So the text segment, as you can see, it is this bottom segment right here. This is your program's code. It's the logic. This is the code you write into the compiler. This is the logic, this is the for loops, this is the bit shifts, this is the function calls, this is everything that you do, and it's called the text segment. This is, this is your code. Now, since this is your code, this is the machine code. So this is what you're going to be disassembling, which is translating the binary into readable assembly. Generally, this is given read and execute permissions. Uh, that way you cannot, when the program is running, write data to it and then start executing it. That's, that's a, that's a no-no. So, the way you know it's the text segment is the binary format will have what is called an entry point associated with it. Now, this entry point is where your, the RIP, the instruction pointer, remember, that is what, that will get set to at the start of the program. So we'll fetch that address from, or that instruction from that address, and it will start executing, and then the program kicks off. One thing that is very important to note is that this entry point is not main. When you compile your program and you write your main function, uh, you need to have a wrapper around that that will prepare arguments and prepare stuff. So your entry point is actually this, this wrapper program. Now your main function is actually an argument to this wrapper program. It's a function that will call after it's done initializing. So if you are loading up the entry point and you are seeing a lot of weird data, this is why. You are probably not going to be inspecting the main function. You might be at the entry point and have navigated to the wrong place. It's important to keep an eye on that because it can trip you up sometimes if you are uh, not too comfortable with reverse engineering and taking apart a binary file. Next up is the data segment. Uh, this is initialized variables, local, global generally. So when you're defining a variable equal to a string or an integer and you're assigning it a value, that's the important part. These are ones where when you create them, they have a value. This is the segment they will go to. This is generally read-write because X can change throughout the program. You need to read X. So that's why, that's, this is how you operate with your variables uh, in a way you don't see when you write in C. This is how assembly deals with it. Now, it has different segment names on different things. Um, generally, it's dot .data, but there are sub-segments of it on different architectures. Uh, Linux, we'll call it dot .ro data if it's uh, static read only ones. So if you're defining a static variable, for those of you who are familiar with C or Java, you know that a static variable cannot be changed. So .r data and .ro data mean read or read only. So these are where your static ones will go. So if you're defining a variable, if you're playing around with this and you define a variable and it's static and you don't see it in the data segment, it's probably in one of these read only sections. Always check these sections. Always check ro data. Always check r data. Always check dot .data because this is where your strings are stored, as I said. So when you're writing a program, you're generally writing debug strings or you're using, you're using strings for most operations because that's how a lot of stuff works. So strings are a great way to get a quick handle on what the program is doing, unless it's trying to hide itself, obviously. But generally, if you're seeing a whole bunch of stuff like HTTP error codes and URI paths and stuff, you're probably dealing with a web server, stuff like that. So it's a good way to get a sort of basic sense of the program you're dealing with and how you might want to proceed. It's nice because you really don't need to do much reversing for this. There's a Linux program called Strings. This will try and dump out all the strings in a program's memory. And that's a really easy way to just tell what it's doing. It will give you library imports because those are important to your strings. It will give you, as I said, any like URI codes or error codes or any sort of debug formats that will be put in by the programmers. It's it's very helpful, it's a very easy first step. If you need a bit more information, object dump, short for object dump, can dump entire segments of memory. This is a little bit more reliable. If you're dealing with a program that might be using something like Unicode, uh, object dump can just dump out all the raw data and you can parse over it and just read over it. You're a lot better at doing that than the machine is, so it really doesn't take too long. This is, it's, only, it's usually not too long, you can't just scroll through it really quickly and get a quick guess of what's going on. So the .bss segment is next. This is uninitialized variables. 
So if I go back here, this would be like if I define int x, but I don't give it a number. So it's, it's a known size, but you're not assigning it a value until you run it. So in this example, we have c equals get char. If you haven't uh, done mechanics yet, or if you haven't coded in C, get char gets user input, it gets one character, and it will assign it to that variable. So this is, this is a known size when you make the program, but it's not a known value until you run the program. So that's what gets put in the BSS segment. Uh, it's used to save space, so you can say this is how big the segment is, but you don't have to define it in the program until it actually runs. So it saves disk space. Uh, obviously, it's not massive, but it is a savings, and it does give you a little <coughs> extra data to look at at what might be in the program. And this has rewrite permissions because obviously char C can change at some point, so it's not going to be read only. All right. Now we're getting to the stack. So that's that. That was that. If we go back to the diagram, the stack is this. This is one of the more important structures, and this is your local variables basically. So when you're defining the, those, the BSS and the data segments are generally edge cases. This is going to be where most of your program logic happens. When you're defining a variable inside the scope of a function that doesn't exist outside the scope, it goes in the stack. Now what the stack is is a dynamic size memory location where you can increase the size and decrease the size as you see fit. Uh, and what you do is you keep track of what is called your frame. So what you're doing is imagine you have a stack of plates. These plates are your variables. So when you want to start a new function, you need a new stack of plates. So you put a little marker saying that everything below this is someone else's plates. You just keep stacking your plates on it. Someone else calls a function. They put their marker on top, and then you keep going. So what they do is if they want to return, they just keep taking the plates off until they hit their marker. And then they go, oh, hey, it's your turn now. So they go back to the other function. Uh, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but that explains the basics of how the stack works because it is a LIFO structure, which is last in, first out. And so what this means is if you're putting the plates on top, you can't get the bottom plate out without taking the whole stack down, theoretically. So you need to take all the ones off to get to the one you want to. So this is known as pushing and popping. Pushing is taking data and putting it onto the stack. Popping is taking data off of the stack into, into memory. Uh, this isn't normally done. Uh, with compiler optimizations, it will usually reference a frame offset. So I have um, right here, it's going to grab from either a positive offset from the RVP, which is the base pointer, or it's going to be a negative offset from the stack pointer. Uh, this is, it's a bit difficult to get used to. It took me a while to get used to how stacks work, so don't worry if you don't quite grasp it initially. Um, having a good disassembler will make it much easier. There are free ones. I list them at the end of this. I will, I will explain to you in depth how they work if you need help. Um, it just, it's practice. This is a difficult concept to get used to, but it's an important one, and once you learn it, you will get much better very quickly. All right, anyone have any questions so far? I know I'm going kind of fast. Anything at all, you can ask any question. No? All right. So next up is the heap. The heap is relatively simple. It's a free-floating data structure. Uh, if you've programmed in C, it's malloc and free. You manage the heap that way. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. In Java, I, I assume most of you have taken Java. So when you call new, that's what it does. Java's garbage collection will automatically delete it. So you don't really have to deal with the freeing, but when you call new, it is allocating an object on what is essentially the heap. So this is also a dynamically sized memory structure. However, unlike the stack, the programmer manages the heap. The program manages the stack when it's compiled. However, the programmer manages the heap. If they mess up, they mess up, and it's called a memory leak. So this stores data of an unknown size. You can define data however you want. want. You can resize it. You can shrink it. You can grow it. You can split it into chunks. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, and it's, it's nice for when you don't know what something's going to be when you compile it. You're not going to know how big someone's user input is or how big someone's password is when you define it. And you generally don't want to set a max limit, which is what you use the heap for. <coughs> and then this brings us into a virtual and physical addressing spaces. So I know I've said the word address a lot. And 
it's kind of an abstract concept, but what it is is an address is just a location in your RAM. So it's just it's just a byte offset in your RAM for where, where certain data is in the program. Now, one thing you might think is what if what if two programs have the same entry point? What if two programs have the entry point of four hundred thousand? Are they going to overwrite each other? Are they going to be fighting for who can run? So this is this is called virtual address space. What happens is they can both be running at the same entry point, and what happens is the kernel will take those virtual addresses and it will map them to physical RAM locations. So if you are at hex 400 in a program's memory, you might be in some random byte offset in your actual RAM stick. So you generally can't modify stuff outside of your virtual address space unless you figure out how to start accessing the physical address space, in which case that's, that's usually not normal behavior and not intentional either. You generally have to be trying to do that. So this is a little hard to understand. What, the, what it looks like is this. So you have the program on the left. And now what happens is it takes these segments. And it, it, the, the kernel will split them up or keep them continuous or whatever it determines necessary. And it will just allocate them to random parts of your RAM based on an algorithm that uses for memory allocation. Now, these, these parts have no relation from virtual to physical, they don't have to be in the same order. <coughs> Sorry. And they, they don't interact with another program's memory because it is tracked to compile time so it knows beforehand how big of a memory space it needs and where it can put it. So now for assembly 101. You have two types of assembly Intel, AT&T. Uh, they are the same theme, uh, they're just different syntaxes. So they accomplish the same task, but they just accomplish it in a different looking way. Generally, Intel is prevalent, so I'm going to be using that. Now, the format of Intel is operation, destination, source. So what operation is, is the action you want to perform on, a, uh, on something. So it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, moving an object, accessing an array. <coughs> destination is the register or the memory address that will be changed by operation. So, for example, if you're adding, the destination will be the plus, the x, the y, the z, whatever you want to save it to, because if you're just doing operations but not saving them anywhere, you're really not accomplishing much. Then source is what uses, is, excuse me, is what is used to modify the destination. So if you're adding two numbers, you need the destination and the source. Now, <coughs> you can't do for example, you can't do z equals x plus y. You would have to do x equals x plus y, and then z equals z plus x. You can only operate on two at a time. You cannot assign to a third. It's, it's a bit of um, an annoyance, but it's what C abstracts out from assembly. So you have to deal with this now, and you will see what you have to deal with. So for example, add rax hex 1337. The, the, the equivalent code is shown below, so you can kind of get an idea of how it's laid out. It's really not that difficult once you start seeing how to structure. You just have to kind of reorder them. But uh, it's, it's really easy to read once you get the hang of it. It's just another coding language, and it's, it's a very simple one. It's a simple syntax. It's just the structuring that is tricky. And there's plenty of documentation for these commands. I'm going to be giving a quick rundown of some of the most basic ones, but there's documentation of plenty out there. If you really have balls, Intel has a 4,400-page manual on them. Uh, good luck with that one. The memory access. You have to access memory at some point, like I was saying. Now, if there are brackets and square brackets, <coughs> like the line below, that is saying you are getting what is at that memory address. So instead of actually using the raw value of RAX, you are going to be using the data that is pointed to by that. This makes sense if you've done C and you have worked with pointers. If you haven't, it's, it's a bit of a concept to understand and you might have more luck by starting with C and learning how to use pointers than going straight into assembly pointers. So these can be accessed by most instructions. For example, the move instruction moves from source to destination. So moving RBX bracket RAX takes what is pointed at by RAX. So the the reference of it for the C people in here, it'll be reference RAX and move that to RBX. <coughs> now, you can, yeah, so you can you can put these in generally any order. For example, add RAX1 will dereference 
RAX. Uh, however, if you put in the red wand, it will do that. So you can use it to save stuff to memory, and you can use it to get stuff from memory. Uh, it's very easy to work with once you get the hang of it. It's rather convenient compared to other architectures where you have to load stuff in manually instead of being able to operate on it directly like this. <coughs> so some common instructions. Add. Adds two numbers. Wow, who, who would have who would have guessed that? It's, it's, it's really easy. These guys wanted to make it as easy as possible. A lot of this has mnemonics. For example, sub, subtract, mo, multiply, div, divide. They have move, move, which is moving from one to another. <coughs> LEA is a little weird. It's kind of like move, except it's used to compute a memory address instead of actually moving data from one location to another. Uh, it's kind of strange, but once you start seeing it a whole bunch and seeing where it pops up, you'll understand. It'll become more intuitive to you. XOR is, uh, it, it just XORs the source and destination. You really don't see this much, except I bring this up because this is very important in encryption operations and decryption operations. So if you see this, there is a moderate sign that, it, or it's a moderately good sign that you are going to be dealing with some kind of crypto algorithm. Call, we'll call a function. So this is like jumping to a function in C. So yes, assembly does support having functions, otherwise it would be very difficult to work with. Uh, if you are trying to figure out how a program is working, don't try and screw around with all the adds and divides and stuff. Follow the calls and see what functions it's calling to get a general overview of how it's operating at a high level and then dig down into what you find to be the interesting parts later. Uh, you do not want to try and reverse the whole program, you just want to try and reverse the parts that are interesting. And if you want to know more about what a, a particular instruction does, I've included a x86 quick reference sheet. Uh, this is a third party site, however I use it commonly because they have pretty good documentation. Uh, it's not really a pain to read like Intel's website is. Uh, so if you need help on an instruction, use that. Or just Google x86 and then the instruction and what it does and how to use it. Or you can also ask me. I'm always more than happy to help you guys out. I know this, uh, this is a tricky subject. It involves a lot of moving parts. It takes a long time to get the hang of. And then one of the parts that takes a long time to get the hang of coincidentally is branches. So. What good is, how many of you like writing programs that don't have if statements? Good. That's what I thought, because a program that does that would be pretty darn useless, wouldn't it? So you have these jumps, which jump to a new location of memory. So when you do an if statement, if you think about it, you're saying, I'm either going to execute this, or I'm going to jump over it and do something else. So this is how conditionals work. And then a fun part is that Loops are just conditionals. So I, I include some samples later, but basically if you see a jump forward in memory, so down the program, you are going to be dealing with an if statement. If you see a jump back up a program, that's going to be going to a previously run part, which means you're dealing with a loop because a loop executes a part more than once. So jumps, if you see one, is just a basic if statement. Now, uh, it doesn't take operands quite like uh, not equal to greater than less than. What has to happen is you call with the CMP function or instruction first, which is compare. So if you're comparing RAX and RBX, what happens is it sets a flags register with stuff like equal, less than, greater than, carry, overflow, stuff like that. And then you call jump afterwards and it reads this and it will operate. Now there are various uh, I guess sub-instructions of jump, there, there's related instructions. So jump is a non-conditional one. This does not read compare. However, if you want conditionals, you're going to be doing something like JLE, which is jump less than equal to. JGE must then be, someone tell me. Jump greater. Yes, see, it's, it's really easy. It's mnemonics, these guys didn't make it cryptic. And you have J and Z, jump not zero. So these will all control the flow of the program, tell you where you're going to be going, and it'll give you a sense of what the variables are doing. For example, if you see one that keeps getting incremented right before a jump statement, you can assume that that is going to be a counter for the loop. So one of the hardest things is visualizing how this looks. So what you see on the left here is C code. I just wrote a basic statement. Uh, on the right, you have what is called a control flow graph. So that is taking the assembly, it's putting it through a tool that will make branches based on where it's executing. So you can 
see where the initialization is. So you can see that it's moving one into this base pointer, which is a offset, and it will go to this compare in JME, which I just explained. We'll compare this and then jump if not equal. So if it's not equal, it's going to go right to this if statement. So this. And so you can kind of use this. Uh, feel free to use this as like a reference and see how uh, C if statements will map to assembly so you can identify the structures when you come across them. Next up is for loops, which as you can see as I explained earlier, it's got this blue arrow over here, this jump. However, it's jumping back to a smaller address than it was. So it's looping back around and repeating the code segment again. So if you don't, if you have a linear disassembler, for example, if you're using GDB, uh, this takes a bit of getting used to to uh, identify it. If you're using a control flow graph tool, uh, like Radar has one. Uh, this one is Binary Ninja, but that costs money, so don't buy it unless you're sure you like this. Uh, this, it, it's helpful to get the sense of how the program's working. It gives you a clearer view of the progression. And it's nice because then you can take these C snippets on the left and you can relate them to the one on the right. I provided these so that way you guys can have a reference. Um, if you want more, if you have a question on what a certain structure looks like, uh, shoot me a message on Slack. I'll be happy to generate some stuff for you and describe it uh, as in-depth as I can. So now we're going to go on to actually doing this. GDB is how I started. Very simple, very stupid, but it works. So this is just a quick GDB. Here's the commands you need to know in a nutshell. So set this assembly in the syntax Intel. GDB defaults to AT&T. The GNU tools will typically default to this. However, like I said, I'm going to be using uh, Intel most of the time. So that's generally what I stick to. However, you're free to use at and syntax if you find it more pleasant. Uh, I know it does have some nice features like defining between immediates and registers, um, but yeah. <coughs> so break will break at a location you set. In this specific case, it'll break at a specific memory address. So when you include the asterisk in front of it, it will break at a memory address which is useful when you're uh, working with memory addresses and instructions because they won't always have a nice little line number associated with them. You'll want to inspect some random instruction and see what the program state is at that point, which is where disassemble function name comes in. You disassemble and then function name. It'll take it apart, it'll display the disassembly, which as I said, is a one-to-one -one translation. So all it does is it puts it through the reverse lookup table and generates the human readable code from the binary code. So, you can use this to find where you want to set a breakpoint and say, hey, there's a jump here. I want to see which route it generally goes down so you can see where the if statement is going, whether it's succeeding or failing. You can do this with info registers. Now, this will show you, it will show you the registers. It will take every single register and it will print out its value, and you can sort of see what the processor says is the current state of the program. Those are the processor's variables, so that's what it's thinking is happening right now. And you can toy with them, you can, you can set them, you can change them, set them to zero, you can read them, do anything you really want. Uh, just try not to break it too bad unless you're really having a bad day and want to just watch your program crash and die. Now, another one's X. Since you're interacting with memory a lot, you're going to be interacting with variables. X uh, is a very powerful memory examination utility provided by GDB. It allows you to print strings, print hex characters, print characters, integers, integers in different formats. It's it's really useful, I love it, and uh, you should get very comfortable with using it. Uh, read the help pages on it because it has a lot of documentation and it's more than I can explain in a short presentation, much less on a one slide of how to use. Just know that X is very useful. If you type help with any of these commands, it will give you copious amounts of usage because GDB includes a lot of documentation. And on to the last part, these are some resources that you can look up. Uh, this is just some tools or places you can go, things you can look up that will help you. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, or you can Google them, find out what they do. Most of them are free, uh, except Binary Ninja is not. And also, actually, yeah, I think Binary Ninja is the only one up there that is not free. I just, it's a very nice tool. Uh, it's only $100 uh, compared to IDA, which is $2,500. Uh, someone wants to, yes? Radar is a, has a debugger built in, by the way. Yes, it does. Radar is a static analyzer. 
Yeah, uh, Radar on there is my current favorite. It's command line, it's free, it's super powerful, it interacts with capstone, it allows you to see everything, it'll generate the control flow graphs, uh, albeit it will be command line based, but it actually does a very good job of working with it. Uh, if you want to wonder which one I say to try first, I would say try Radar or GDB. GDB is a little simpler, but it, uh, because it's simpler, lacks some of the cool features that Radar has. Uh, I also use Ida. Yeah, that's twenty five hundred dollars, unfortunately. Oh uh, well. The free version is. I might have a copy of the EXE from class, so if people want. It's <laughs> you, yeah, it's like yes. Yeah, it's really nice because it gives you like a nice graphical view of things. Yeah, so a lot of these tools actually do that for free, which is nice. I used to be the only tool that would uh, give you a graphical view for the longest time. Uh, however, Radar and. Binary Ninja and Hopper have added those, uh, so now there's a competition on the market. However, uh, Ida is nice. It's got a lot of plugin and a lot of community support. Uh, if you want to try it, there's a free version. It will only work on x86 binaries, which is in 32-bit, not the 64-bit versions. Uh, I think it might disassemble 32-bit ELF as well, but don't quote yeah, me on that. It does? Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? This is uh, questions. <coughs> All right, so <coughs> we're going to head up to Stack Lab now. Uh, I've got a couple binaries for you guys to take apart and have fun with. Uh, I will be posting them shortly. We will get to this, and you guys will learn how to become the leaders of Go get pizza. Take Jamie's pizza. It's free.